Carl Baby Door. Um, we do have a quorum. Uh, we'll miss him one tonight. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins is uh, under the weather, so keep him in your prayers if you would, please. Um, we'll start tonight with uh, Pledge of Allegiance first and the invocation. Um, for the Pledge of Allegiance, we've got uh, Brad Cornwell's. Uh, he's a troop leader. He's got uh, Troop 118 from Zion Church here. And if you got a couple guys to come up and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we'd appreciate it. Or the whole group that you want to come Order 
our Cleveland County Board of Commissioners, directing the Cleveland County Tax Collector to collect the 2013 property tax levy and any unpaid taxes remaining for the prior 10 years worth of less. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Commissioners, you've heard the consent agenda. I'm on the consent agenda. Any discussion? Any motion? All those in favor, please uh, raise your right hand. <coughs> Next item on the agenda uh, is uh, I know all, all of us are excited about uh, hearing more information on and it's Cleveland County Pumps, and we've got Willie Green here to present. I know you've got several of your board members here as well. Yes, sir. Uh, you'd like to recognize them while they're here? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate the opportunity. First, I want to recognize my board, my founding board, Mr. Willie McIntosh. You may be one of those. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine and helping me through all this whole process. Uh, I Brian, have been done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Brian Bragg, Bragg, Bragg CPA. Uh, he's another founding board member that's been very instrumental from a financial standpoint. Uh, keep crunching the numbers and making sure everything is right. And we also have Reverend Dante Murphy, who's the pastor at Shiloh Baptist Church, and also the current president of the NAACP. Um, uh, in absence, and I think he should be coming here shortly, we also have Chief Jeff Ledford, uh, of course our chief of police here in Shelby. Uh, these guys have been with me from start to finish, and, and I really appreciate their Again, once again, I want to thank you. I appreciate it. I want to thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to speak to the county commissioners about the Cleveland County Promise. I want to, first of all, before I kind of get into my presentation, and I'll, uh, it'll take a little bit of time, but I'll do what my father said. I'll take my time, but I won't take too long. Uh, and given this, I think this is a program that could truly benefit this community in a lot of ways from the economic standpoint, educational standpoint, and also creating jobs. Um, before I get started also, I want to recognize one other uh, partner in this, and I have a person in uh, an organization or an entity who has been a tremendous help to us, and that's the Shelby Star. Uh, they have been, uh, Jessica, I think she's sitting over there, she's been uh, really a fireball in getting this thing uh, out in the public and because of her articles the people are excited about it. So I want to thank Michelle for starting with their um, Just to kind of talk to you about how I came to the Promise program and how this was developed. Back in 2011 I was coaching in Arkansas, uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, coaching for Washita Baptist University so that you can say that about 10 times, you're very good, but um, when I was coaching down there, I came upon this Promise program, and uh, I started looking into it while I was down there, and kind of put it on the back burner. Um, I thought it was a great idea, just really didn't think it was a great kind of, you know, to get it off the ground. Uh, it wasn't until I came back home at the end of 2011, early 2012, and that screen, and, uh, I, I, we experienced this, and we, we, we all know the story behind this, where we have a native Brandon Spice who went to the Super Bowl in 2012, and as you can see, he's um, not too pleased with uh, his years of living in Cleveland County, uh, right or wrong, uh, whatever side you take on it, that was his issue, that was a concern, um, and it created a lot of uproar. But it also brought attention to a couple of things that not just happened in Cleveland County, but across the country. But then we started doing a little research. Uh, this article ran before Brandon Spikes. Uh, Brandon uh, decided he didn't want to live in Cleveland County anymore because it, uh, it was a bad place to live. Uh, Josh here uh, is from Cleveland County, lived here all his life, and he really 
don't see there's a future here. Uh, so both him and Brandon has the same common denominator. Is there's a reason why not only Brandon, but Josh and many other are leaving Cleveland County. As a result of the Promise Program, the Shelby Star ran a great article, uh, six pages in their newspaper, addressing the issue about what Brandon talked about and what Josh talked about and what all of us talked about, you know, the reason why people are leaving Cleveland County. Uh, we obviously have an aging crisis. Uh, and you can see as, as well, they, they also talked about education, which we know that we also have an issue with education. And now with the new budget cuts in the state that we're going to lose, I believe, 100 teachers. Uh, and a lot of issues are going to, it's going to be a tripping out effect where we're going to have problems with graduation rate, uh, kids' ability to pass test scores. So with those four stories, uh, it just really excited, ignited me to talk about this promise program because, again, I think it can change the way people see Cleveland County and it encourage new businesses, new jobs, and also address the educational situation we have. We also have a problem nationwide where there's a lot of uh, issues with tuition. We see that the tuition rate has doubled uh, over the last couple of months since July 1st. And Congress has not moved on that. Uh, we also see where, uh, in fact, the historical black colleges and universities are now considered suing the president because of uh, now, in order to get a, a student loan, they're basing it off of parents' credit scores. And we all know that the people who are going to be affected by this are students or entities that's going to be affected by this are your low income minority community as well as the historical black college and university because they were now tuition more than donations. So just an overview of what we want to talk about and I'll kind of get to it again, leading to the issues with the aging crisis. Our vision is really just to make Cleveland County a premier place to reside as well as receiving a quality education. Uh, we can, I was just through this, but I wanted to just talk about our organizational summary. That first sentence is very important. Cleveland County Promise, we are a nonprofit organization. We will form to provide all graduates of Cleveland County. Well, it doesn't matter if you're your race, your economic background, your social status, or your educational level, every student will qualify for a Promise program. No one is excluded. In addition to that, we looked, and there's there's not a family or a business or a person who's living in Cleveland County that will not benefit from this one way or another every day. Again, our mission statement is to you know seek private donor donors uh, to help prepare our young students for a future. Uh, just a brief history. This is not something that I invented. Um, uh, there's a number of Promise programs that have created and are very successful. The first one was started in Kalamazoo. Ironically, the same reason why they started in Kalamazoo is the same reason why we want to start it here. The automotive industry was leaving Michigan. And as you can see, Detroit is bankrupt right now. Uh, and so they were trying to find ways to uh, address the dropout rate in the educational situation, but at the same time, trying to promote economic impact and trying to encourage people to continue to live in Kalamazoo. I mean, it's just right down the street, but I played in Detroit with the Lions, and uh, I think the population rate in Detroit has dropped from 1.5 million people to almost 800,000 people. Uh, and so Kalamazoo was experiencing the same thing, so they kind of took a proactive approach and they created this Promise Program. There have been several Promise Programs followed, uh, this board in particular that we've looked at, Kalamazoo, which is, of course was originated in 2005. Pittsburgh Promise started in 2006 as a result of the Kalamazoo Promise. And as you can see, all these are privately funded organizations, nonprofits. Uh, in Pittsburgh, you see that the Pittsburgh Medical Center has committed over $100 million, uh, which they're doing a matching grant. And for every dollar that the public, that the program raised, they give in 65 cents. 
up to $100 million. In El Dorado uh, and Arkadelphia, too, that I've worked very, very closely with in El Dorado. Uh, El Dorado population is probably half of Cleveland County, and the only donor is the guy who owns Murphy Oil, and he's committed $50 million. Uh, and then Arkadelphia Promises, uh, created in 2010, and it is funded only by uh, Southern Bank Corp and the Ross Foundation. Just a quick results from these promise programs. Uh, it's obvious that they have been successful. Uh, you see increase in advanced placement, enrollment, schools, uh, decline in the dropout rate, which I'll show you, which is just startling. Increase in graduation rate, years of rising test scores. Uh, the one that I really love is more parent involvement in school activities. The parents are now fired up. Uh, they see that their kids have a future. They see that, hey, uh, I cannot afford to send my kids to school, but now this promise program can do it, so I want to make sure I do everything I can to make that happen. And once you see, history shows that when you have a parent involved in school, the kids are a lot better. Plus, the parents put pressure on the teachers to step up to teach, and you'll get those students who are the class clowns out of school or to step up because there's going to be a demand for it. We also <coughs> see that the expansion of tutorial programs, nonprofit organizations, and mentoring programs. You see more kids enrolled now because, quite frankly, we do. We know the history of Cleveland County. We are a textile agriculture county. Uh, not a lot of education was required to those jobs, so you had a lot of people quitting school. So the difficulty is, is a lot of parents want their kids to succeed, but unfortunately, they don't have the educational knowledge to help them with their homework. So this is where these nonprofit organizations will step up and fill that void to help that parent and help their child. The one that I'm also really excited about, and I was amazed at this when I started looking at this, the boost in the local economy, job creation. Just in El Dorado, when El Dorado uh, Promise started, uh, as a result of that, they've had 28 new students from 13 foreign countries. And families have located from 33, we've got 31, there's 33 different states have relocated to El Dorado. Uh, and these are working middle class people who make too much money to afford any type of government assistance, but they don't make enough to be able to pay their kids to go to school. So now they're excited about it. They're going to those places, they're opening up their own uh, businesses for the money that they've saved uh, for their kids. They're putting back into the local economy. They're finding new jobs. They're creating new jobs. In El Dorado, home sales went up 4.3% in 2007. At the same time in Arkansas, at the state level, it was declining at 8.8%. So that was a tremendous shift where everybody else or every city in the state of Arkansas was going down. El Dorado was showing a tremendous uh, increase in home sales. And you know, we all know in 2007, uh, we were in a housing crisis. Uh, and one of the programs, the minute, the day that they announced the Promise program, they had a, sub, uh, uh, a contract announced that he was building a $10 billion subdivision, and he's been very successful. These numbers are startling, but you can see in kind of did a little graph here. Uh, you can see before the El Dorado Promise was uh, introduced, uh, they were at a dropout rate at 8%, while the state of Arkansas was at 5.24%. But you see the dramatic drop, almost 6 a 6% point, from the year that the, the, the year that it started in 2007-2008, and it has continued to decline, but it's sort of leveled out uh, in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. By comparison, if you look up top and you see North Carolina in red and Cleveland County in different colors, here's where we are. You know, we are Cleveland County is above the state average and way below Arkansas. And you know, we, when we think of Arkansas, we think of poverty, we think of just really a, not a pleasant place to live, but you know, they're they're beating us in education for our outreach. Just a quick uh, run of our program and all this information is on the website for people to see is www.theclevelandcountypromise.com. But just to go through the eligibility requirements, any student who graduated, as I stated, 
uh, whether it's a public school, whether it's a private school, whether you're homeschool, or whether it's a charter school. If you live in Cleveland County and you belong to school in Cleveland County, you should have the same rights as everybody else to be eligible for this program. So we don't eliminate you because of what school you go to in this county. As long as you live in this county, and as long as you go to school in this county, you qualify. I'll get into the specifics of qualifications based on the level. Again, the terms are we pay for uh, four years of tuition and mandatory fees only. Not housing, not meals, not any of those things, just tuition. And we base it off the most expensive public university, which is UNC Chapel Hill. Now, just amazing, when we first started this program and looking into this program in 2011 and doing our research just less than two years ago, UNC Chapel Hill is at $7,198. So you can see just over the last year or so how tuition has increased. Uh, we will use a middle dollar approach where uh, the student must first fill out, uh, uh, apply for a FAFSA, which is Pell Grant and North Carolina Lottery. Uh, whatever they get in that, then we will pay the difference, and I'll show you in the slide how that works out. Okay, here are the residence requirements. We don't want, you know, once we are able to start providing scholarships, it, you know, it's not fair for someone to relocate here their senior year and get 100% of the money. So this is how we base it, based off your school and how long you've been in Cleveland County. Uh, what additional requirements? Um, you know, we also have a problem with kids not going to school. So this hopefully will encourage uh, students to stay in school. Uh, where we've seen this implemented in El Dorado and Park Adelphia, their, their attendance rate is at 90%. Uh, so it can be done. Uh, another thing that we're adding, which no other program add, is we're making it mandatory for every student who, before they graduate and before they receive any of our funding, they have to attend and complete a financial literacy online program. Uh, we have one in place. It's free not only to the students, but it's free to the families. It's free to, free to the Cleveland County public. Uh, the great thing about it is we can base the different modules on the level of the student. Obviously, a ninth grader or a 10th grader or 12th grader does not need to know about home ownership at this point in time, so we can kind of piece it. The other great thing about the Money Skill Online Program, they can do it at their own pace in the confinement of their own home as long as they complete it by our deadline. But I can also, and my advisors will also be able to monitor their progress. So they can't go to the next module unless they pass the first module. But we will be able to know how long they're spending on and how much time they're spending on and so forth and so on. So it's very detailed. That way we can gather those statistics and data and use for other research. Um, maintaining eligibility, I'll go through this pretty quickly. You have to have a minimum of 15 hours per uh, credit semester and 30 hours per year. Uh, we will not pay for summer school. Here's why. Uh, this is addressed the aging issue. We want to start having the kids to have a mind frame to come back to Cleveland County. So we are requiring our students, at least their freshman and sophomore year, to come back to Cleveland County, volunteer at a nonprofit organization or with an organization, or work under an internship with one of our uh, prospective sponsors. That way it teaches the, the child about the uh, workforce. Uh, it teaches them how it's also a resume builder. Uh, and it's, always, it's also teaching them how to network. The biggest problem with our kids is in our society, we live in a bubble. And the people that we communicate with are the only ones we live with. And so what we're trying to do is ex make you expand your bubble. To, to communicate with people that you normally wouldn't communicate with. So we're trying to teach them to give back to the community, be a part of the community, and hopefully, hopefully, while they're here, they decide, well, when I graduate, I want to come here and start here. So that was the mindset. No other program has this as well. Uh, funds will be, be distributed, distributed directly to the university. They send us an invoice. We send the money to the university. The students do not get the money. Uh, our students allowed to transfer. Uh, what we've seen based on dropout rates, and we looked at and you can see that the highest percentage of people who drop out of high college 
are the people that have gone from their freshman year to their sophomore year. Uh, and then once they go from their sophomore year to their junior year, it kind of slows down and then you know, the dropout rate is higher. We don't know the reason why directly, but I would guess by us all going to college, they're either homesick or they really just couldn't cut it at that university. So if they re-enroll somewhere else within the four years of their time span, then they still will be in be able to qualify. Uh, this, what I feel, is the, really the heart and the nucleus of our program. No other promise program have this. Uh, this is our support center. We will have at least, we will have four. Right now we're working with two, we may work with two, but we will have career and financial advisors, so college and financial advisors in every high school. We've already met with Dr. Boyles and We've established that partnership. Now this person's sole responsibility will be to help the counselors at that school, but primarily focus specifically on making sure that the students are college ready, make sure that they're filling out the necessary application. There's a lot of people, unbelievably, that doesn't realize that they can get their grants, don't know how to apply for college. So this support center will be that means each, each high school will have a classroom, with computers and it will be sole purpose for that community uh, college and financial advisor. We will open 30 minutes before college uh, school and stay 30 minutes after. We will have some weekend session for parents to come and fill out their grants or fill out forms. Uh, our career finance advisor will specialize in identifying other scholarships that those students may or not be able to get based on their university so they will have much knowledge in that. And they will also look at other grants and scholarships that are available outside of Cleveland County or outside of that university. Some other foundations, the Gate Foundation, the Oprah Winfrey Foundation, those types of things. So this, this will be a very integral part. Um, here are our support centers, the resources that you will have available with all the college applications. Our financial advisor will also set up visits for college visits, campus visits, but also uh, arrange for colleges to come down and recruit. Uh, one of the incentives that I think this program have in uh, getting our kids into school is if, the, if a university knows that this kid is going through the Cleveland County Promise, they know that kid will be ready. They know that kid will also have four years of tuition. So I would imagine UNC Chapel Hill and all the other schools when they're looking at applications and you got a kid from Cleveland County and you got a kid from wherever, I think they'll probably choose that kid from Cleveland County knowing that they're going to get four years of tuition, but also knowing that they're going to have a kid who has been through a system that is very disciplined and they don't have to worry about that student from the standpoint of uh, dropping out of school or, or in a sense, uh, flunking out of school. Uh, go back for a second. Uh, uh, services also, again, uh, as I talked about, we have worked with them on the SAT preps. We will have evening workshops for the parents who are working nine to five. We will have one-on-one -on -one group session. We will have coordination college visits and all that, so forth and so on. Uh, oh, uh, go back to uh, We will also evaluate. One of the things that, uh, uh, when I was doing my research, it was very, very difficult to find data about when our kids leave the county, leave Cleveland County, where do they go? We have no idea. We know if they go, we have ways to track if they go to uh, other schools, universities, but what about out of state? What about when they graduate? We have no <coughs> idea. And these are the types of things that we need to have those relationships. So this, the support centers will keep this type of data. It will also have data on progress where we can also use those things when we're talking about bringing new jobs and new businesses in where we can use that data to show that we have a work ready workforce. Uh, and we will also be able to evaluate based on the college born rate, based on the students who apply, all those data and statistics that we are not currently privy to right now. Uh, this right here is the last slide and uh, I'll open up for questions. Uh, as I was talking about, here's some data that we pulled uh, we have on average about 1,100 students. We got this information from the Shelby Star. Uh, we have about, out of that 1,100, we have about 76% of the students that are graduating at this point in time. 
uh, which is about 669 of those 7, 836 have gone to college, which is about 80% of the kids who are graduating. Uh, and we also show that of that 80%, 24.8% have gone to two-year colleges, including community college, and 75% uh, uh, are going to four-year colleges. Where they're going out of state, we have no idea. Uh, they're going to a private university, we have no idea. Uh, and over to the right column on the same block, as I was stating, of that 669, 65% of them did not or went back to uh, to uh, college their sophomore year. And as you see, as they did at junior senior, they seem to stay a little bit longer. Uh, to the right of that box is the uh, the most expensive college near here, which is CCC, uh, and the most uh, most expensive. University, which is UNC Chapel Hill, their tradition. Now, here's how the uh, distribution of what we call the gap works. Uh, we base it off of families' income. How we derived the least, we took in a lot of data and statistics based on free or reduced lunch, based on the demographics that we grabbed, and we compiled it into a data sheet. Uh, and so you can see, let's take, for instance, a person who's going to a two year college. Parents make less than thirty thousand dollars a year. They should be able to receive all the lottery grant and Pell grant, the maximum amount. Uh, so they would not have to. They would not receive any gap money from the Promise Program. But obviously, they're getting other uh, resources such as the support. And in addition to that, we can identify the scholarships for them. Uh, people that are making uh, parents and household income making thirty to forty thousand. Uh, the gap would not have to pay for them at a two-year college because of CCC tuition. Uh, and then when you get up to 40 and 50, to 40 plus thousand, the gap pays a difference of $173 for 40 to 50 and 41873 for uh, for families that are making over $50,000 a year. Uh, same thing for four-year college. Uh, without going into the details of it, but you can see kind of what the gap pays down in the ground based off of uh, annual household incomes. Uh, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, what we would ask uh, simply from the commission before I take questions uh, is what we're simply doing is we're in our fundraising stage. Uh, the, as I stated, the Cleveland County uh, uh, show we started has been done a, a tremendous job. We have received over uh, 300 applications just from the students in the 2013 class. Uh, I can't tell you the number of phone calls I get every day and the testimonies from parents who, who are saying that this is much she needed. You know, it's, it's something that really inspires me to move on. So what we're simply asking of the commissioners, Mr. Chairman, is just a letter of support right now uh, that we can take to uh, our local businesses and businesses outside of Cleveland County uh, to ask them to support the program. They need to see that the community is 100% uh, behind this before they get um, That, if, if any of my board members would like to add anything, um, I'll open up the questions. Thank you, Mr. Is there any questions? Yes, Adam. I'm going to have some questions. I'm really supporting this, but just the other day I was watching on television, and they were showing household income. They were showing comparison. They said a household family making $53,000, okay? And they used the $53,000, but you said it, and the $50,000 made nothing for support. But they showed the same basis as a family making less than $30,000 with benefits and the things they apply for. They actually made more take home pay than the person making fifty-three thousand dollars. So that's why I question why would you offset a person if that's the case making forty, forty five, fifty thousand dollars a family, if you made less than thirty thousand dollars, you'd be better off to take a lower paying job and apply for the different benefits that we've got in the community. And that's what they were saying and this was I don't remember what channel it was, but anyway, they said that uh, a person making thirty thousand dollars or less, a family benefits more than that 
individual out there working making fifty three thousand dollars a day, he pays taxes. After he pays all his programs, he pays the kids to go to school, he pays a different pay. So I guess that was my question. Why would we where did you get the the different breakdown for different pay for the kids? How do you establish that? Well, again, we looked at what the family uh, actually stated, a person the family making $30,000 or less. Yes, they are uh, able to receive federal funding, such as Pell Grants and, and, uh, and lottery. Uh, and, you know, we, the, 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 when I looked at this program, I really, I wanted to look at everybody. But, but mostly that middle class family who does not qualify, make too much money to qualify for uh, any type of payroll grants, but they don't make enough money to get a student loan or afford a student loan. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's a disadvantage of uh, but, you know, uh, having uh, someone who makes $30,000 versus someone who makes $50,000. I think that the person, if, if you look at a person who's making $50,000 a year and ask them, would you rather make $30,000 and receive benefits of $50,000, the vast majority of people say, I'm going to stick with $50,000 because it's a matter of pride. It's, you know, I, yeah, and, and I, I agree with you there. I said it's a matter of pride, but do it again, it's a matter of economics, you know. And, and I guess I was told at the same time, you know, every, every time I'm going to apply for something, you know, Always a lower number, a lower number. And you talk about the, the children, forty to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, they can get a loan, but they've got to pay the interest back on that loan. When they get out, they got to pay the loan back. So the kids making thirty thousand dollars or less in their family has the competitive edge on anyone finishing school if you've got to do the, the loan, the repaying, and so forth. If not, I'm against the program. I, I support the program very well, but I think that something should be a consideration for those families that's in that catch-all, and you figure from the $30,000 to $50,000 bracket, that's where the families are getting caught. Well, that, if you look at the program, if you look at a first kid family who's making $30,000 to $50,000, you see they're going to get more tuition where they don't need a student, they're not going to need to apply for that student loan that you to with the high interest rate. They're the ones who will receive most of the gap funding. Uh, not the people that are making 30000 who are already getting those benefits. So I, I, I want to leave that up. Yes, sir. Well, I, I guess I thought that I'm willing to go to the region charge that all of you. But, you know, that's that kind of stuff. You know, it's, uh, it's based, on, based on, you know, different criteria. Now, I can tell you, we've, we've made a lot of presentations uh, to all the rotaries and to a number of business people, and I can tell you that they see that this is a tremendous return on an investment. Uh, they can see where this will encourage more businesses to come to Cooper County. We, I know we have a lot of data, a number of data centers that are here. It hopefully will encourage them to expand to different spaces, but also bring more data centers. I think this will be a, a great incentive uh, uh, for uh, Cleveland County. It will be a great recruiting tool. I know I was talking to uh, Dottie Levin, who was one of the first persons that I talked to, because at the time she was president of Rotary, Rotary, and she said this will be tremendous for the hospital, the medical center, because we can't compete against uh, Charlotte uh, when we go out to try to recruit doctors. However, if we can still continue to pay a doctor what we can afford to pay, uh, and then give them an incentive that if you have two or three kids, at least we're covering your kids' tuition, that will cover, that will encourage that doctor to move here. So it's an incentive. It, it's sort of like a tax break uh, for those people who are in that in-between, and also encourage a new business. I can tell you, history has shown us that Every last one of these programs have been successful, and none of them are on the decline. In fact, they have now, and we're going to be attending uh, two PromiseNet conferences, where now this type of program is starting to kick off 
and other cities are excited about it. So now they're having to have conferences to teach people how to create these. So uh, with, 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 with the declining uh, funding from government, uh, the private sector is having to step in, but the private sector is seeing a return on their investment when they have a program like this in their area. And I, I didn't ask the question to you, David, because I, I do support it. Like I say, my only question was that $450,000 range, you know, even if you recruit a doctor, he's going to be making more than that. But anyway, I, I do support the program. I think, well, yeah, I, think, I think there's several things in there that you could elaborate on that are very distinct positives. Uh, elaborate on what Commissioner Hutchins said, too. Having been in education for several years, lower income families have less problem qualifying for financial aid and Pell Grants in particular. But there's one very distinct advantage the program has is it has to provide supervision. And uh, that's a negative, very distinct negative the federal government uh, in the education program such as Pell Grants. I mean, we see it all the time. Kids who qualify for Pell Grants come in and get their Pell money. Uh, then there are other financial stress, uh, various reasons. They get their financial Pell Grant money, and then all of a sudden the stress takes precedence over education in the new school, right. uh, which defeats what Pell is really for. So I, I think uh, the opportunity to provide supervision is enormous. Positive and plus the opportunity to provide assistance to the middle class people in the gap that you refer to across the today's society so often. The people who make a hundred thousand dollars a year and make an afford to send their kids to school, people who make a fifty thousand with all the other financial stresses that they have on their families really can't really afford to send their kids to school. You know, they make they they want to go to school. Right. They get caught in that squeeze that you refer to. So I think you got a, a, a great opportunity and I can see uh, where it might take time to be over uh, and down the road it may almost get up it's the quality of life for those kids as well as spread out in the community to do. I think uh, appreciate your willingness to work with us. Thank you. Really, I, I want to tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing. Um, several things that I see is one thing I do want to see the kids come back to Cleveland County, and that's something that is important to me. And, and having a, a, an educated group of people and kids coming back to Cleveland County, understanding Cleveland County, and I've been very active in the last many years with um, nonprofit organizations with children, uh, a lot of them low income children. But a lot of them have the capabilities to do what they can do, but they don't have the support arm right. at home, the support at home. They don't have a family that's going to help them get to where they need to be um, because either they don't know how to do it, they don't know where to go, or they don't want them to do it. And I would like to see the pattern stop in Cleveland County that I have seen over the years of continuing on because of the family support. So you guys are saying, hey, we're going to help, we're going to let people know from kindergarten on that when they graduate from high school, they're going to have some funding there available to them if they're not affordable. Or if they, if they can't afford it, we're going to show them how to get, get the funding. Whatever way it means, we're going to give them that guidance. And that's what we need. I think that's where we're going to start seeing that pattern, the change in our community, and, and start strengthening our community by doing that. Mindset that hey, I can't go to college if I want to go to college, and hopefully, you guys will also get help them won't go to college. Absolutely, give them that support. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that we looked at, we, we really, you know, to, to my board, um, the members of my board was tremendous. But we looked at this and we looked at all of those what if possibilities. And I know when we look at that, and the person said, Well, you know. A kid who the person why should I support it when I make thirty thousand dollars or less? I'm not getting any money. But what you're getting is a support system. You're getting someone who is helping you fill out 
applications and help you get some other federal grants and other types of grants and other types of scholarships is helping you uh, with tutorial programs. So you may not receive any dollars from this, but you're receiving some resources from this. Uh, and so, you know, we look at every spectrum and, you know, when we look at this, most scholarship programs, not just here in Cleveland County, but across the country, either you have to be a 4.0, you have to be a minority, you have to be a low income person. And that's not fair to the, the working middle class. And so we wanted to make sure that we do not discriminate against anyone uh, from this program. Uh, I was a C student and I graduated from college. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, you don't have to always be an honor student to graduate from college and be successful. Uh, so, you know, we, we wanted to look at everybody. And like you said, Commissioner, I wanted to, and I'm glad they used the term promise. I want to promise those young kids there by the time that they graduate, from high school that they will have the opportunity to go to college to this degree as well through this program. And as you also pointed out, uh, there's a lot of parents who can't help their kids, uh, who now they see that I have an opportunity or someone is gonna pick up where I have not been able to help and to encourage it. So this is a, we looked at this thing, and if you go back to the top slide, or the first slide, topic of it, you know, our heading is we want to invest, we want to educate, we want to enrich, enrich and we want to unite. This is not just about 4.0 kids. This is not about low-income kids. This is not just about minority kids. This is about this entire community. Any other comments? Well, I like to say there's, a, there's so much good about what you've shown tonight. Uh, definitely improves the quality of life improves opportunities for uh, not only for our young people but for our families and our communities so um, I want to thank you for that and there's there's no shortage of ambitious people or ambitious programs that, that we've seen in our county um, that's evident by what's going to be going on over the next couple of weeks uh, hundreds of volunteers and, and a lot of kids going to play ball here um, this is one of the most ambitious programs that I've ever heard of in Cleveland County um, opportunity for uh, each one of our kids to be able to attend school and as parents, I want to thank you for that as well. So, if I could add one other thing, uh, and speaking to the Legion Ball, uh, you know, I'm an avid. Everybody thought I was going to go to college and play baseball. Baseball is my number one sport. So, when I'm looking at this promise program, those families who are coming here, I hope to recruit some of those who have some top rated baseball players to move to Cleveland County and be able to play in a top-notch, one of the best high school fields that I've ever seen, uh, and encourage them to come here, even if their kid does not get a scholarship to USC or some major baseball program, we will pick up that so they will still have an opportunity to go to that Division One school, much like our kids here in football. I'm, I'm a state with the biased sports and say, there's a lot of kids who don't get, because of the limited number of scholarships, don't get that recognition. But if we can still send that kid to a Division I school, let him go up there and show that university what he can do, then they'll give him a scholarship at the end. So it gives him a second chance to prove to people that we've got some great athletes, but it also recruits some of those parents that relocate here, play in that field, play at Shelby High or Burns. I'm a Burns guy, but you know, be in a place where then we can expand our sports and going up uh, programs around here. Thank you. Commissioners, I heard a lot of information out of uh, Mr. Green. The only request that I heard out of the, the whole conversation was uh, potential letter of support. Um, so if you would like to discuss that, or if you want to discuss that now, or if you want to uh, talk about it, think about it, and bring it up next meeting. Uh, I think the letter of support. Even though there's a question I had, I had in the day, I'm with uh, the program. I'd like to make a motion that we do do a letter of support that we do support the program. I think uh, it's not second. Yeah, first and second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand.
we'll get that to you. Thank you. All right. Next item on the agenda is uh, tax uh, foreclosure property. We've got uh, Chris Green, if you'll come up. Chair, uh, Philip and Beverly Love have submitted a sealed bid for the purchase of parcel number two nine six one seven. This is a vacant uh, lot. It's located on its main street in Shelby, uh, just off of uh, Cabbage Drive. Uh, this property was acquired by the county through a full blood interaction in 2006 has been offered for sale uh, since that time. Uh, a, a deposit has been submitted and certified on the required. And once that happens, uh, publication is made to that effect and opens up a uh, real upset bid period. Uh, that has uh, all been done. which is the bid from Philip and Beverly Love in the amount of $500. Uh, the county investment uh, in terms of taxes and costs associated with this property is $2,360. The current assessed value is $1,731. Um, now, the bidders understand that uh, they are responsible for any other fees Including advertising, reporting fees, revenue stamps that might be associated with the, uh, with the sale, or the commissioners uh, so choose to do that. The guidelines for disposal of foreclosure property uh, suggest the minimum be equal to one half the assessed value or the amount of the county investment, which is greater. Uh, we've discussed in the past these are our guidelines, and they may not fit every situation. Um, and the board has full discretion uh, in this decision uh, whether to accept or deny any deal. Uh, of course, it is an opportunity to get uh, a property back into private ownership, which is, uh, has always been uh, something that we can take it and do. Um, so, with that, uh, submitting to you the high bid on this property, parcel 29617. $500. Um, we would need a motion from the board to either decline the bid or to accept the bid and authorize the sale of the property. Any questions? Any questions? Sure. Uh, my understanding is you can't, you probably can't build any of anything on the street property. This the property is it, it is definitely for the city for the building. So it's not buildable. For the issues with topography, uh, it would probably be a, a, a lot somewhere in the 12000 $12, dollars range as, as opposed to what we have here. I think the lot for them. Want to say five acres? Yes, sir.
people that have applied for that committee that uh, both have been through the training uh, that's offered by the county. Um, and from my understanding, that, that board is uh, in dire need of people to serve. We have two, two of them. We have, uh, I believe, more than two open on that board right now. for a one-year term, their term will expire June of next year. That time you can read one or one of Got a motion? Is there a second? Second. Over. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Next one is for the Clinton County Jury Commission. On the Jury Commission, um, we have four uh, people that have applied for that position. Um, Jeff Ames. Jeff Ames currently serves on the Jury Commission. Um, and his term, uh, let's see, if we, if we appoint someone to this board now, their term will expire on June of 2015. But as 
been a, a, a busy couple of weeks, and uh, um, I would ask for everybody to keep the uh, volunteers and, and special Jim Board and Eddie Goldbrook uh, in your prayers. And if you see them walking around in the little days, give them a bottle of water and tell them to take a break for a second. So they, they'll definitely be able to work. Um, uh, it was neat for me this week, um, or last week, to be able to uh, attend the best program and uh, uh, see how everything kind of uh, um, merges together. Um, to hear Commissioner Allen uh, talking, she did a great job, uh, but talking about uh, how you know our, our roles and things that we do at, at, in this position as county commissioner, um, you know we need to do things to bring young people back here, and then to hear. Uh, Mike Clinton uh, can promise uh, how that ties in with that. It's, uh, it's neat. And it definitely puts a lot of pressure back on our court. Uh, puts things in perspective for us here, here in Speaker's Life Time. So thank you so much. Unless there's anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you so much. <coughs>